All set? Thanks, Ben. Okay, good morning. So today I will talk to you, oops, start. <laughs> talk to you about the problems in, uh, in Bengal. Bengal means both Bangladesh and uh, uh, West Bengal in India. So of course it's far from being my own work. It's a bunch of students, a bunch of collaborators from different countries and I acknowledge the funding by France, by India, by, and by the European community, which has been very helpful. So what we are going to speak about today was what WHO called the largest poisoning of a population in history. Uh, and this uh, poisoning uh, comes mostly from water, but now there are more and more concerns that it's also coming through the rice. This poisoning is not uh, the kind of poisoning, I mean arsenic poisoning, that you have heard of usually. I mean, the acute toxicity, it's an old story. People love to kill each other with arsenic. You see, it started with the uh, Roman people. It continued with the old uh, widows in the Victorian uh, England and so on and so on. Uh, what we are going to speak about today is a very uh, low level uh, contamination which on a long term, which create this chronic kind of toxicity. So, and with this kind of disease, uh, so what are the, the problems? You have, I mean, the, the figure is quite viable. It's, it goes from 30 million to 100 million people affected. So, I mean, something like 80 million is a, is a, a good average. Uh, what you see most in the press are these kind of figures, uh, pi pictures which show this hyperkeratosis. That means you get uh, kind of horny skin. But in fact, um, Alan Smith, who is professor down in, at Berkeley and head of uh, epidemiology group on arsenic, has shown um, that the, the skin disease is not the main problem with arsenic. Uh, uh, he has studied a population not in India, but in Chile, in Antofagasta, which has been exposed for 15 years to a uh, very high dose of arsenic. Uh, and because it's at the middle of the desert, they didn't have access to any other water. So he could follow this population uh, afterwards to know who have been exposed in the fetus, who has been exposed as a kid, and so on. And so what he has shown is basically the 50, uh, 50 nanogram per liter, which is the uh, threshold for all Southeast Asia. Here or in Europe, we now uh, have adopted the WHO limits of 10 nanogram per liter. But 
uh, in, in the Southeast Asia, the people, I mean, the government still stick for the moment on this uh, 50 nanogram per liter because we are going to see that usually you have figures which are orders of magnitude larger. So exposure of your, during your life to this thing is the equivalent with, give you the equivalent risk of a passive smoker, which is about one out of 100 to get cancer, lung cancer. And if you go to 500 nanogram per liter, and you will see that it's quite frequent also, you get the one to 10, which is the risk of an active smoker. Anyway, so there are plenty of other symptoms, uh, but that's, so that's a framework. And the thing you have to know about the chemistry of arsenic, I'm not going to bother you too much about the chemistry, but you have a redox chemistry, which is quite complicated. And we'll discuss shortly about that. But the idea is until now we have considered, and this is again a question now, that the mineral, I mean the inorganic arsenic is much more toxic than the organic arsenic, which is for example opposite to what happened with mercury, where it's the methylated mercury, which is the most toxic. And until now, it has been accepted that the arsenic-free uh, arsen uh, form of arsenic is uh, more toxic than the arsenic-5. Uh, but again, uh, people like Alan Smith are questioning this kind of, uh, of preconceived uh, data, and apparently all, all these species are, um, are toxic. So, so how did we get to this point? The problem, it started with very uh, good intention. I mean, people just in the 60s wanted to solve the problem of, uh, of hunger in India. And, uh, and so in the 70s, 80s, they started to a huge uh, campaign of drilling wells uh, in, uh, the, in Bangal. So you have, again, more than one million wells. You have seen figure even to seven or 10 million wells which would have been drilled in the area. And of course, you allowed uh, double, to double or triple the production of rice. Uh, and you, you allowed also to fight against some other disease. Uh, oop, as you can see here, the, so you, basically the more you, you develop the irrigation, the more you develop the production of rice. So that was been the very uh, positive point of this campaign, but again, um, as we will see, I mean, it has brought a, a large problem, which is this problem of contamination. So let's first look at some detailed uh, data uh, from the field, because when we started this whole business about 15 years ago, people were speaking about it, but there were basically no, uh, no data, especially on the chemistry of these systems. So the first thing you have to understand is how the, this groundwater were formed. Basically, uh, at the time of the last glaciation, the level of the ocean was much deeper, so basically the hydraulic gradient was much uh, larger, so the, you ha you, uh, the deposits are some kind of red, reddish um, sand uh, in the Pleistocene um, uh, aquifer. And after, the more the, the, the level of the, of the ocean raised, uh, the more you start to develop this kind of mangroves that you have now uh, along, along uh, the ocean. And the more you deposited some gray uh, fine sand, which are, uh, the, which are the, uh, the, the aquifer, I mean the problematic aquifer. So basically, uh, when you had low sea, le uh, sea level, you have this reddish sand, and you have oxic waters, or at least oxic uh, minerals, and no arsenic in the water. And if you're in the top layer, you see all the form is basically in the top aquifer, you, which was last, I mean, deposited in the Holocene. You have uh, gray sands. The system we see is full of iron, too, and full of arsenic. So that's typical, that's the data from our field, but all the data are exactly the same thing. Basically, you have uh, five to 20, uh, five to 15 meter uh, thick clay layer at the top, which <coughs> allow to cultivate rice and things like this. 
And after, you will see later on that uh, the local system to drill wells allow you to drill a well of 30 meters, that means 100 feet, in one day. And this is really the average uh, depth that you, you find here. You see most of the data uh, around this depth. And this depth is, uh, of course, the one where you have the largest amount uh, concentration. And after, when you go down, you, uh, you, you get this uh, Pleistocene aquifer where you have very low uh, amount <coughs> of arsenic. So if you look at the BGS uh, British Geological Survey map of uh, contamination in arsenic, what you see is that you have this uh, basically along the coast uh, where, where this uh, shallow aquifer is the most available, uh, directly available to the people. You have this high concentration of arsenic, and the more you go to the north, the more you, go, you get sandy stuff at the top and the less uh, contamination you have. So basically, what I will discuss today is both our side, hillside, which is Chagdaha, which is about 30, 40 kilometers north from Calcutta, and uh, the site from Columbia University, which is here close by Dhaka. So our site is along the Hooghly River, which is uh, the branch, the Indian branch of the Ganga River. And like you ha what you have usually at this, uh, in this kind of environment, you have very complicated sedimentology. So you have uh, paleo meanders here. You have uh, <coughs> abandoned river channels here. All this will be the, the flood plain that we'll, oop, that we'll discuss later on. And after, you have here, uh, I mean, you, you go from about, here we are about three meters above the ocean level, and we are still 200 kilometers from the, the sea. I mean, it's uh, really flat. And here you have, uh, you are about uh, six, seven meters above. So the, basically the town has been developed here. Here is the railway uh, system. And, uh, and the other feature that you have to look at are these ponds. I mean, it's not very clear here on the, but basically uh, everywhere the people have been digging ponds to first to, to build their house because again, they, they excavated the clay layer to make bricks. Uh, but also before people were drinking, were washing, were doing everything in these ponds. And these ponds are, are, have a major impact on the hydrology of the of the system. So if you look at our size, so we have still this Hooghly River here, and what is typical is uh, to have a kind of hot spot. You see, again, here I put the 50 ppb, which is the uh, Indian limit, our limit is 10, and you see that we are far, far away uh, in this area. Again, uh, so the question is how we got there and how this is going to change. And again, if you look at the, on the hydrology, because you have such a flat system, you should basically shouldn't move at all. Uh, the problem is during the dry season, you, the people over pump the, the groundwater, so basically you make a hole in the piezometric uh, surface, and so this is going to speed up the transfer of arsenic uh, in the groundwater. So uh, <coughs> some data about this. Groundwater, so I told you this uh, exactly, I mean, basically the, the iron uh, data mimic the arsenic data, so you have plenty of iron to, in the system, we will see later on that we have equilibrium with uh, I mean, over uh, uh, order of magnitude sur saturation with respect to sideride, the carbonate uh, iron too. And uh, if you look at our site, it looks a little bit homogeneous. <coughs> Uh, but when I started to discuss with Flex from Guin from uh, Colombia and his colleagues, they uh, told me, well, you didn't sample enough uh, wells. Uh, we have sampled 2,000 wells. You have sampled only 100 wells. And if you sample more, here is what happens. So you can start to see a huge heterogeneity on, uh, of the system. So you see, this is, oh, sorry. So this is along, this is the old Brahmaput River, which flows that way. Um, and you can see that uh, basically close, uh, close together, you have wells which are high quality and wells which are very uh, poor quality. So the question is to understand, there are two, two 
point. First, to understand how you reach this kind of huge uh, heterogeneity. Second, is for them, is the, the campaign to make well switching, that means to, to, to give people, I mean, to, to avoid the, the to, so that the people avoid to drink the worst water and get linked to the best water. Those are all the same depths, then? No. Uh, we'll see that, but you will see, you will see next that even uh, the same depth, you have uh, 100 meters apart, you have completely different chemistry. And no, no, these ones are not the same depth. But again, you saw that from the main map, I mean, usually most of the, de the wells are uh, 20 to 40 meters deep. I mean, it's, uh <coughs> so uh, we started by drilling, you know, we were European, short-minded. <laughs> European, so we started uh, classical drilling. We spent lots of money for nothing. Uh, <laughs> and after we learned from Lex uh, and from our Indian colleagues, this, uh, the, the, the local technique, which is done here, I mean, it's done in everywhere in Bengal, which consists, you, basically, you, you dig a hole here, full of water, and you put a pipe. And after you bring the pipe up, and at the time you, you push it down, you open your, your hand so the, the water and the mud gets out and you keep going on like this and they succeed at, with about four men to dig uh, 30 meter in one day, which is just, uh, if you have the regular rotary system, it doesn't work, it heats up and everything. I mean, this is work fine and what is even better, what, so that's Lex, it's, uh, we don't see it very well, but what he has developed is um, a chamber, what he called the needle, needle sampler. So here is your tubings that you use for drilling. And at the end of this tubing, you set up a chamber where you have put, uh, vac I mean, you have done a vacuum in this chamber before. And basically, you have a needle. That's why it's called the needle sampler. You have a needle which is first in the plug. And now you, you bring back the tubes uh, in that your well. And when, it, whoop, and when it hits the, the sediment, basically it pushes back the, the needle in the chamber. You suck out water and fine particle, which has been sampled at a very precise depth. And that's very useful because so you, you, have, you, have, uh, you have both the water and the fine particle at a fine depth. You can also m make the system <coughs> so that you can collect also the microbiology. So there is, I mean, so I think it's a very, very good uh, technique. And so we have been using him with him. And so this is our site. So now uh, I concentrate on the floodplain. This is a floodplain. So we have been drilling uh, across the floodplain. But before to drill, we did also some electromagnetic conductivity. And we recognize that along the river and here, which is about here, you have uh, uh, infiltrating, I mean, sandy soils, basically, and everywhere else is, you have this kind of clay cap that you see here on the logs. And <coughs> so this is to answer your question, Steve. Uh, <coughs> I mean, you, this well, so this is one well, two wells, three wells, and they are about 100 or 150 meters apart. I mean, it's a, it, and you have a huge, um, a huge, uh, heterogeneity. First, uh, I mean, even if you look at the sum of the cations, you know, when we started this project, because the river is, uh, is going that way, we thought, okay, we are going to follow the, uh, the flow line of recharge of the groundwater, what you read in the textbook. The problem, as you see, it's not going at all the, that way, the, the water. And uh, so, basically, what you have is whether you have this infiltration area, you have a low concentration of cations, you have high concentration of sulfate, that means basically the sulfate concentration of the river. And, uh, and in contrast, wherever you have this, uh, the, the more impermeable cap, you develop high concentration of cations, which are both calcium magnesium, but also mostly iron, which start to be very important in the groundwater. And as you see here, you don't have an exact uh, correspondence between these guys and this guy, but basically you get uh, this uh, high arsenic uh, concentration wherever uh, the system is capped so that you have basically uh, developing 
uh, anoxic environment which will uh, create, which will, where we will have the reduction of sulfate and disappearance of the sulfate. So basically, uh, in our field data has shown that you have two uh, contrasted systems. First, the permeable system, where basically you inf infiltrate both by irrigation, by monsoon, by all this kind of system of recharge of the groundwater. You, you have water which is uh, sulfate rich, iron 2 poor, and acid poor. And other places where you have this clay uh, layer, uh, where basically uh, you get, whoop, you get this uh, high iron, low sulfate condition. And at the AGU meeting in Cambodia, where I was last two weeks, people who have been studying the age of this groundwater found that again in Bangladesh or in Cambodia, when you study the uh, tritium uh, A, I mean you study the age with the tritium helium system, basically what you follow is from the recharge to the isolated system, you increase the aging, you increase the acidic concentration and you decrease the, sulf the sulfur dissolved concentration. Uh, our uh, site is in a way quite similar to uh, so the, the problem in our sites, if I come back, uh, is as I told you, um, these are extremely perturbated environments. I mean, you have on a four by four, four kilometer by four kilometer, you have something like 100,000 people. So, I mean, they are just bumping and just changing everything around. So, different groups have uh, <coughs> tried to, to, to focus on areas which are less affected by humans. Uh, to understand how was the system at the beginning. So you have the, D the Danes who are working in, um, in Vietnam in, uh, around uh, Hanoi and the people from Stanford who are working in uh, Cambodia just south of Phnom Penh. So they, they have uh, studied uh, an area <coughs> and uh, basically an island of the Mekong uh, where basically you have large wetlands so you have lots of water recharge here, and but you have closer to the river, you have this ox bow and pounds, where basically all the sediment is deposited every year. And what they found is same thing. So you have this uh, more sandy environment where basically you, you push uh, rather clean water, and after you have the place where the, the sediment is deposited every year, where basically <coughs> you you develop this high concentration of arsenic uh, and they go very high, you see, they go to 900,000 uh, and, oops, sorry, and this is, of course, you see, Phnom Penh is here, so uh, of course here is a very inhabited, I mean, there are lots of population here and they are drinking all this water. But to come back to our point, the idea is that you just, you have an increased arsenic concentration <coughs> when you go from this highly permeable system to system which are capped by impermeable uh, layers and they have done a calculation which I think we have to consider careful, I mean with caution because there are large error bars but still if you calculate how much uh, sediment has been deposited in the last 10,000 years, you study the average concentration of arsenic coming in and you study here what, are, what is going back to the Mekong the basically, you are roughly at a steady state system. So that's for the field uh, data. Now let's have a look to first to how we tr uh, are going on this transformation, this transport, the trapping, and after we'll come back to larger scale problem. So with Tony Apello, we started to, to model uh, this system because what, what is puzzling is the fact that in the Ganga River there is no arsenic and just a few hundred meters you have plenty of arsenic. So just making a simple calculation, just uh, looking at the increase of PCO2 due to the bug's uh, respiration and after the, the uh, reductive dissolution of the iron, we assume that ferrohydrate was a carrier of arsenic and we'll see that's wrong but that's still the most classically used uh, uh, support. Uh, basically, you end up with a concentration which is of the order of what you observe in the field. After, 
Here with uh, Tony, we, we decided to try to model along what uh, is a flow line, I mean the average flow line of the area. Again, we, d we, we cut our system in small cells. We again took uh, some kind of ferrous, ferric hydroxide as a uh, iron uh, source and we modeled that for 100 years and basically so that's the starting uh, concentration in our system and if you, uh, uh, what happened, what appears in this modeling is that the local variation of pH which result in a large variation of bicarbonate have the strongest effect. Again that's uh, after 100 years uh, this will be uh, the modeling if you consider just the propagation of your water and your arsenic. But if you input, uh, if you put in bicarbonate and other competing ions, you see that you are going to have a release, a very tough release of arsenic. And in fact, if you look at, for example, um, adsorption on mica, and you have lots of mica in this uh, ground, I mean, in this aquifer. Basically, the range of pH in the field are exactly the, the range of pH where you go from nearly 100% adsorbed to nearly 0% adsorbed. So a very small uh, change of pH, again driven by the respiration of the microorganisms, uh, lead to a very strong release, which is a very uh, big problem because as you see, you, you are getting basically to the water that the people are drinking down in the down, downtown. I mean, there is no... <laughs> it's, it, you don't have a two, I mean all the houses are one floor houses, but they're very dense things. So what is going on? You have these kind of bugs here, it's Geobacter, but in our case it's not, but it's, uh, you have iron uh, reducing bacteria which are consuming some organic matter and there are lots of discussion about which organic matter uh, is consumed or is not consumed, where does it come from, does it come from the, from the, the irrigation, does it come from, from the human, uh, uh, or does it come from, I mean, the petroleum, I mean, there are lots of discussion about that, but the idea is you have this reductive dissolution <coughs> of, of iron, which is where you solve the arsenic, which release both the iron to the bicarbonate, and if you have enough, you precipitate uh, silverite. And s this has been observed by Céline Palu, who is a new member of the a department where I'm in a sabbatical uh, at uh, Berkeley and she does, did that while she was postdoc in Stanford. Basically what she has done is to take, uh, she built some artificial soil aggregates. That means you take sand, uh, uh, quartz sand, you take iron oxide, you take uh, iron reducing bacteria like Chauvinella, you glue that together with agarose and after you run it in a, whoop, in, um, you run it in a flow through uh, system and basically after a few days, oh yeah, not very good with that, uh, after a few days you start to develop at the, at the middle of the, of, the, um, of the aggregate you have this siderite which is developed. So basically you have a radial uh, uh, development of, of your reducing condi condition. Uh, <coughs> so we, uh, with a student of mine who is also both a colleague from some of you here uh, doing lots of modeling but also doing microbiology, we have been uh, studying this release of arsenic and we found that uh, like the people in Manchester, like different groups, uh, if, you, uh, if you just incubate your system, Basically, you, 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 st you have the release of iron, which is coming fast, and the release of arsenic, which is much more delayed. And all the question was why this was going on. And we developed a model, a pure thermodynamic model with kinetics. But where you basically what you say is uh, in the first phase, you basically the H decrease. Uh, uh, the more you release the iron and it decreases up to the point where it hits the arsenic, four, five arsenic free uh, boundary and then you uh, start to, to release the arsenic. Why? Because first uh, you are in the system where the arsenic is five. So it's, you have to remember arsenic five is like phosphate. That means it's, 
It's very, very strong at so on the particle. So basically, if you dissolve this particle but you don't change the, the speciation, basically the arsenic is going to stick to another particle. Uh, but at the time when you, 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 you reach the, the redox boundary, then arsenic-3 is much weak, more weakly at so, so you start to have this release. And so well, that's the kind of model that we, we have done. What is the most important is basically the fact that uh, this, uh, this curve is completely dependent on the solubility product of your iron-free phase. And the uh, solubility product of ferry hydrides is one of the worst data. I mean, uh, you, you have a large scatter of data in the literature. So basically, we have to play, we have to play around with this solubility product. And the <coughs> you, when you play with the solubility product, basically, you play with the size of your particle because we know that there is a direct relationship between the uh, with the <coughs> ener surface energy uh, between the size and the solubility product. And so when we did this work, basically we end up uh, using a solubility product which corresponds to particles which are very, very tiny, which is exactly what Glenn and what other people before found to be the uh, unit, basically unit uh, bricks, if you want, to build up skirtite and the other guys which will mean that in this kind of very heterogeneous system, again, we never observe ferrihydrite uh, in this system. I mean, we have some kind of still so-called amorphous iron-2, iron-3 system. It looks like the arsenic is uh, absorbed on these very tiny un units. And, um, and uh, well, that's one of the, because one of the main questions of all this system is we have very, very uh, little data on the, on this iron phase which are controlling all the chemistry of this system. So that's one of the window to look at this. Now, which other things for, uh, which thing do we have for arsenic and what we do? So you know this kind of stuff. The, the arsenic, like all the iron, can be either absorbed or precipitated or surface precipitated. And again, <coughs> I mean, it has been very hard to, to build the bridge between the field data and the lab data. I mean, usually these are order of magnitude difference. But now, oop, this, uh, if you look, so that, that's a little bit the opposite way it's usually represented. You, here is the arsenic at soap, that means you, what you can extract with phosphate. Here the arsenic in solution. These are data from us and from many other people which have been gathered by Lex Fungin. And basically, you, you have this, uh, especially if you take off the, the empty points are the points which, have, uh, which are in oxic environment. So basically, you end up in some kind of linear stuff, uh, a linear relationship. And if you um, compare the KDs you obtain, basically, you, you end up with this uh, uh, something which is not too far away from the different KDs which have been observed for the different uh, phase which are which, are, which could be formed in this reducing environment. So that gives some op optimistic point of view, I mean for me at least, to try to, that what we do in the lab has some kind of relevance to what happened in the field. And uh, so in the oxic environment, I mean Glenn and us and many people have been uh, uh, discussing how the, the, the arsenate can bind, monodante, bidante, mononuclear binding, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, the problem, the major problem, and we did this compare that with selenate and so on, but the major, oh, the major problem is that we don't have fair hydrides in this system. If you, uh, again, the group in Colombia has, has developed a technique which is using the reflectance, uh, and that's an easy technique you can do in the field because basically you have to imagine that we are 40 kilometers north from Calcutta. Just to go back to Calcutta, it takes three hours. Huh? So uh, to bring uh, any kind of uh, uh, liquid nitrogen or anything to, to conserve your data is a huge, huge logistic problem. So uh, anything, any technique you can use, like his needle sampler, any technique you can use which is simple is really very important. So in this case, this reflectance technique, which is a technique developed in the painting industry just to measure the, your, your spectra, uh, you can relate some uh, change in the reflectance to the iron-2 to iron total content. Again, these are field data, so it's not a perfect linear relationship, but it gives you a good idea of the, 
of <coughs> the amount of iron two. Again, in the, this is in the solid. So the, the idea is that you have very little pure iron three oxides. Uh, you, same thing, you don't have pure iron two uh, oxide or carbonate or whatever, but all our solids are somewhere in between. So uh, there, have been, there are not that many uh, models, uh, I mean good minerals to, to look at. So recently there have been some, quite a good amount of work done by this guy. That's a group of Paris, which is linked to Stanford, and that's a group in, uh, in Marseille, which is more li linked to Rice University. And uh, basically what they have shown is that you have this kind of three four corner sharing uh, complex at the surface of magnetite, and that just this uh, could stabilize the, the few nanometer particle that they have. And uh, on magnetite, we have done some work also uh, showing that both that uh, field data from the MIT group, from Harvey and co workers, that's our data, so of course we don't have the same number of sites on our system, but basically the, the <coughs> And the, uh, basically, magnet, uh, Makinawite is a poor sorbonne. Uh, that's the first point. That's, I mean, that's not proof. We haven't done the exact so technique like this on that. It's a poor sorbonne. And uh, so basically, when you form what the people of the field call the acid volatile system, that means this uh, so-called, which were previously thought to be amorphous iron sulfate, sulf uh, iron sulfate you, you absorb a uh, little, um, you absorb li little acid. And uh, the other uh, mineral, which, I mean, again, we, we said you have mica, which are also in this system, and after you have um, carbonate. You don't observe very often carbonate with the, with the X-ray, but again, if you discuss with Gary or with these kind of people, they tell you in soils, you need to have a few percent of uh, carbonate to have the chemistry of the soil controlled by the carbonate. And it looks like it's exactly what happened here. Uh, basically this, you see that we are at equilibrium with rhodochrosites, calcite, dolomite, and we are supersaturated uh, with uh, siderite. And we know that we need about one order of supersaturation to precipitate siderite. So basically you, you, you as shown by, uh, <coughs> by Celine, you, you, you may have very well at a very tiny uh, level formation of carbonate. And so we investigated uh, in which extent the arsenic could uh, substitute for carbonate in this system that's the work done by Alejandro Fernandez Martinez, who is here. And basically we did that with Newton diffraction and different other technique. And we followed the, the basically the more you, you put arsenic in your system, you, you allow the system to swell according to Vegas law. And uh, our data, which uh, our model, which is this one, is in fact uh, very close to what has been developed uh, by Cheng and his co-worker uh, using standing wave spectroscopy. He was investigating the adsorption part of the isotherm, and we are more investigating the co-precipitation uh, part of the isotherm. But in any case, wh whether you are here, you saturate your surface or you start to, to co-precipitate your system, basically uh, the intercalation of the arsenic, in this case it's arsenic free, in, uh, instead uh, in, the, in the unit cell le leads to the same kind of expansion of the unit cell. There are still a lot of discussion. We have big debates with our Italian colleagues who are doing ESR spectroscopy and in our case, we assume that this was, the substitution was done by protonated uh, ESO3, and they say with ES, uh, with Spinnaker ESR, they don't see any proton around, so uh, we sh will need to perform some Mulliken population analysis, as Alex has done on, because we did the same work on gypsum, and he has done this for gypsum. And after we have to know, because uh, with ESR spectroscopy, you are, you are probing basically the manganese uh, environment. So the question is, do we have any kind of iron pair which is trapped in this calcite? And this would be also important because all the 
arsenic, I mean, many of these arsenic contaminated uh, waters in, uh, in Bengal are also uh, contaminated with manganese. And there is a big NIH, NSF uh, research going on now to try to see if the manganese has uh, an effect on the toxicity of, a uh, co effect on the toxicity of arsenic. So let's uh, go back uh, to the um, uh, upscale. Uh, w once, oop, yeah, once, so we have been going from the field down to more or less the, the, the nano level, and now somehow, somehow you are asked by the politician, you are asked by everybody, why, what the hell, your studies, what can we, what is it, what are the use of use for the local people? And of course, the problem is decontamination. But also the problem is to see where is this arsenic come on, coming from and are we limited to this, a few uh, sites where we have the problem or do we have to expect it on a more, much more larger scale? So that's uh, exactly what the people are asking us when we are in the village sampling. So for the treatment, if you look around the world, I mean, it's rather easy in developed countries to treat water which are contaminated with arsenic. The best example is Los Angeles, which receives its water from mammoth uh, lakes and this kind of area, which are very high in arsenic. So you just oxidize the arsenic free to arsenic five, again, back to the phosphate kind of iron. And uh, you, or you can, so you can do that with ozone. You can also do that with manganese oxide. This has been this is used in India. Usually they, they have one column of manganese coated sand. It's used even in France because we had, when we changed the, the low from 50 to 10 ppb, we had very good mineral water, which suddenly became improper for con uh, consumption. I mean, it was forbidden to, to sell the, the mineral water. And in France, as opposed to here, you are not supposed to treat the, the mineral water that you sell in bottles. So that was a big debate. And finally, they agree that this water, which are usually volcanic water, well, w could be allowed to flow on a sand and a manganese uh, sand. So basically, it removes the arsenic. And it's not too, I mean, that's kind of philosophical discussion. Where do you stop, where do you start the, the treatment, where do you stop it? But anyway, so that's also a good system. But we studied that with uh, uh, <coughs> Christophe Tournasa. And basically, you, you precipitate uh, phases which are still quite soluble, but you, uh, so you basically you oxidize your manganese, uh, your arsenic free to arsenic five, you, and after you, you finish basically the, the work with oxides, whatever the oxides. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's this kind of system that which are uh, developed in, in India and which are um, working quite well. The main problem is a social problem. I mean, because, uh, again, these are very, very poor countries. So before to get that, the, the people in the village have to gather and start to keep some money uh, to show to the government that they will have enough money to maintain the system afterwards. And so the, the government come, he set up this kind of, of, of technique, and after two years, the people have to take care of, of it. See, which leads to a few problems. First, what do you do with the waste? That's often not very much, uh, I mean, people don't pay enough attention to that. But also it can be, it can lead to a real social problem. I just was, we were in one of these villages and one day the school bus arrived and stopped and the kids, of course, jumped. It was 40 degree or 100 Fahrenheit and they jumped to, to drink this water. And the people of the village started to fight against the kids because, of course, their parents are not paid for, for the treatment. So, I mean, it's a, that's not our field. I mean, this is not a, that's more a social science problem. But you have lots of work to be done by the NGO, the social science, to, to, uh, to set up this kind of, of uh, system. The other system is to, um, to press, if you, as I told you, in most of the system, you have lots of iron. So, the idea is to, to oxidize the iron, and doing so, you trap the arsenic. Uh, so you either do it directly with the dissolved oxygen, uh, and Stefan Hoog from Airvag in Sutton has done lots of work on very good chemistry work to, to, comp to understand the whole uh, chemical uh, pathway of this uh, system. And you can do that, as I will show you in a minute, with arsenic. I mean, arsenic-5 is also oxidizing iron, too. 
Uh, but again, you have lots of uh, problem of silicate, phosphate, and so some of these techniques are working in some cases, some of the are not working, and it's not very easy to predict when they are going to work and not going to work. So again, the, the, all these techniques are built on the, <coughs> on the, the oxidation of iron too. For example, if with oxygen, that's this old data from Sturm and co-workers, which show that if you go from iron two to iron OH to iron OH two, each time you jump six orders of magnitude to kinetics. That means you go six times, 10 to the six faster. So, uh, and this is, uh, this effect of dissolved uh, uh, OH, you get it, whoop, uh, you get it also from the surface OH group. And that has been called for a long time this autocatalytic effect of once you started to precipitate your ferric hydride, you speed up the system. But as we showed on particle, like mica particle, basically you are on the edges of the particle, you can also speed up the, the oxidation of uh, iron two by the reduction of arsenic. And so you have basically the coadsorption of iron and you have after the, 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 the redox reaction between iron two and arsenic. <coughs> Other measure which can be uh, recommended first to limit the pumping in the deep aquifer. Right now, I mean the tendency is to drill uh, not at 30 meters but at 100, 200 meters where you have this iron, uh, the arsenic free aquifer. The problem is um, uh, in this meet, AGU meeting in Cambodia where I was, you have people looking local hydrology, uh, regional hydrology calculation and they really clearly show that if you start to, to, to pump too much, you are going to suck the, the top layer which is the only contaminated layer and, and this huge uh, aquifer which should be considered as a strategic aquifer for drinking water is, is going to be mixed with the arsenic. So you are just expanding the problem a lot. So I think you should avoid that. Uh, after you have the WHO, which is with the people from Colombia recommending well switching, uh, which have also had some problems with ac acceptance. And you have also the Dutch people are extremely good to, to, to try to inject oxygen uh, to, to precipitate the iron in the groundwater. They have the same problem. They have iron too, they have arsenic. And you, the problem you have to, to play with different wells, otherwise you plug your, your well. Uh, but you, you uh, again, playing on, oh, playing on this uh, catalyzed oxidation of iron too, you, you slowly expand your, the, the volume which, is, which can be used in your groundwater. And of course, everybody is hoping for that the nanoparticle will help. There has been work by, uh, uh, on, uh, on magnetite, uh, showing that you, of course, magnetite is a good adsorbent of arsenic, that if you bring back to the surface area, basically, whatever the site, it's, it's working the same way, but there yeah, are good hope that you can separate it if you are, you are in surface treatment. We have worked with nano zero invariant iron, uh, which is also a promise, promising uh, technique, except the thing that you see the, the zero charge is occurring basically at the, at the pH that you have in your groundwater. That means, I mean, all these nanoparticles, they work very well when they are dispersed. And the problem is when you bring them uh, in a condition where you have no charge, so they tend to uh, aggregate, uh, we, it will not work as well. And uh, there are lots of development by NGOs on uh, different systems, basically where you have, uh, you mix nails and, uh, and bricks and you also you develop some kind of flower pots, you know, where you can even control the size of the pores. You can add a silver nanoparticle to kill the germs and so on. Uh, so there were lots of discussion at this meeting, especially with UNICEF people who try to see uh, if these things are working, on which time length they are working, and so on. Uh, so it's not a perfect solution, but I mean, it's, it just has to be improved. And I think we need lots of education and training. That's our engineer, and that's, we were in, in uh, working with a student in the field two weeks ago in Laos uh, to basically to, to develop, we, we, it's a European program that we have to, give, to help the people to develop master prog program in environmental chemistry just to teach the people who are 
to measure their own system, control their own system, and so on. After you have to understand what's <coughs> the link with uh, what we call now medical chair chemistry, all the other guys I mentioned, the manganese, but there are lots of questions on the selenium where you somehow you, you've cooled uh, precipitate selenium in your body or excrete uh, arsenic with selenium. But uh, when you discuss with Alan Smith, I mean, he's very afraid because everybody says, well, you should feed the people with selenium. So, oh, no, no, we are going to create another problem. I mean, so it's not uh, so easy. Last point is where is arsenic coming from? Uh, it's not an easy task because if you try to reconstruct the system, I mean, it's clearly coming from the Himalaya. But uh, first you have to, you have, I don't know, 50 kilometers of Himalaya, which has been eroded in the last uh, few million years, so you have to understand what was there before. Now it's a, a few a thousand meter deep sediment in the delta. But also the, the hydrology of the system has completely changed. So you have to understand that. You have, and uh, for the moment, what we think is that it's not the arsenal pirate which will be the source, but you probably you have serpentines which, uh, which would have been the source of arsenic. Uh, these are data which were collected not from this part, but from the other part, which is going to the Indus. And you have lots of arsenic in this serpentine kind of mineral. So now we are drilling here to, to, to have a 30,000 year record to see uh, when this arsenic was uh, uh, bought. Just, we are just at the foothill of the Himalaya. And if we get this kind of stuff, and the uh, last thing on the large scale is what has been doing uh, Lenny Winkle, who, when she was in Yavak, she's now postdoc with me, where she took all the geological data, all the soil data, everything, on a big uh, GIS uh, uh, program to try to, to reconstruct where, I mean, this, what we know is here, we know a little bit here, and a little bit in Hanoi, here, and that's it. And <coughs> doing this kind of work, it was quite interesting because uh, she could show that, for example, in Burma, uh, you here, you should have a huge problem. Of course, you know, there's a dictature right now, so it's not that easy to go to sample. But at least it helped to predict where our com the problems are coming. And uh, we are going to look at also the Chinese uh, Pearl River Delta, where we assume there could be also the same problem. Anyway, to conclude, Arsenic uh, probably originates from the serpentines in uh, Himalaya, it's transported, again, the Ganga River has no arsenic in the water, it's, it's, it's transported on a variety of particles, and it's released uh, in large part due to the activity of this iron reducing bacteria. You have a very complicated redox chemistry going on, need to do some spectroscopic work as you do and as we do, and to link that with the medical uh, people. Thank you. And that's if you want to know. <coughs> Thanks so much. Do we have questions for Laurent? Yeah. You uh, talked a lot about cleaning up the groundwater. Uh, is there any way of just providing clean surface water and not just this elaborate cleanup process? I, got, I mean, I've been <laughs> discussing that a lot. The problem is a very human problem, you know? You drill a well, you punch on a button, and it sucks your water. It's really no work. If you maintain a surface uh, irrigation system, you have seen here. Here you are only, I mean, apparently with Obama, you are going to restore uh, irrigation system which has been built in the 30s or 40s. And in, in, the, in France, uh, we have also a very huge surface water. But it's a lot of work to maintain this, uh, and a lot of money to maintain this thing. So it's a more an organizational problem, but I completely agree. We should uh, restore all this. Of course, you cannot irrigate everywhere. You can irrigate what is not too far away from the river. But in this delta, as you say, the, the, the system is nearly flat. So we should push for that. But it's, uh, again, it's, it's a problem of organization. I mean, here, like in Europe, there have been very strong states which have been saying, OK, we are going to design this huge irrigation system. And you know how much discussion you have here in California about why well, I mean, I've been following the, the story. And we have the same story in, in Europe because, for example, France has irrigated the Mediterranean coast and now Spain is asking for the money, for the money, for the, 
the water, I mean, Barcelona and all that don't have enough water. There are lots, exactly the same discussion as we have here for the Delta we have in Europe, between France and, and Spain and so on. So you have this problem and remember that uh, Bangladesh and India are nearly in, in war. I mean, they are very, I mean, for example, to, to get the, the, the satellite picture, it took me many years to, because we are 50 kilometers from the border, it's flat like that, but it's considered a strategic area. So it's only because of France working at EADS, uh, European Satellite Agency, that I could get the picture. Otherwise, it was locked by the governments. So, uh, and that's a big problem. Uh, the, the, it's like between Turkey and Iraq. I mean, where, you know, a priori Turkey can stop the, the water to go to Iraq. We, they have the same problem between uh, India and Bangladesh. I mean, there is, uh, they, I mean, some, lots of problems to control who is getting the, the water. So that's the problem, international problem. And after you have the more local problem to organize, I mean, to have a strong state which organizes this uh, large irrigation system. Uh, and again, if you don't have uh, this state organization, it's the easiest if you drill, you punch, I mean, you punch your button of your pump and, <laughs> and you suck out all the, the good quarter, but on the long term, it's not good. Yeah. You mentioned in the end that there are two different ways to situate the container. One is through water, and the other one you said is light. Yeah, that's. So is there a bio uptake of arsenic? Exactly. The that's, there is a big, uh, I mean, it's emerging uh, uh, big, uh, I mean, lots of people are looking at that. Uh, <coughs> I've seen even at this meeting, there were a few people who were saying that now 40% of the exposure will be through ice and only 60 through water. I mean, until now, it was considered that most of the exposure was through the water. Uh, we have also found out that at least the people who have done the speciation work has shown that in rice you have inorganic arsenic as opposed to the arsenic you get in seafood or in this, where you have always the organic uh, arsenic, which is supposed to be less toxic. So, no, they, there are lots of, uh, the Chinese are doing very good work on the cycle of arsenic coupled to the cycle of nitrogen in the, in the paddy fields to, to understand uh, this uptake of, of arsenic. Uh, but no, it's, I mean, before, you know, you had this kind of easy-minded uh, <coughs> idea that, you know, rice is one of the only plants which contains tubes inside, I don't remember the biological name, but tubes which bring the oxygen to the top of the roots so that it creates around the wood in a completely anoxic environment, it creates an oxic uh, sphere. So you, you, you oxidize the iron and you precipitate the arsenic. That's all. And it works. But apparently it doesn't work, uh, especially for when, what we were discussed at this meeting, the, the absolute tip of the, the wood is growing faster than the, this uh, plaque, this iron oxide plaque. And this is what extracts the most water. And so the, and this water is, so that will be the, but right now there are lots of studies on, um, on the arsenic in rice. And in fact, French rice is the worst. <laughs> and, uh, if you look at, I mean, they've been studying all the rice around the world and the Camargue rice at the highest arsenic concentration, but we don't eat very much. So it's uh, so mostly a problem for the people who eat that twice a day. So. No, but that's, that's a big issue now. And also, there's a big issue on the rice content, on the water, the, the cooking water, because, uh, again, what is going on in the cooking water? I mean, can you pick up the, the arsenic in the cooking water? If you, if you start to, <coughs> to recommend to use two different types of water, one for drinking and cooking, uh, one for drinking and the other one for everything else, the cooking water, where do you put it? Do you put it in the... I mean, does it have to have this high quality water or not? I mean, that's the uh, issue which are discussed and studied very much right now. The iron oxidation? 
Well, you, you, I, as I told you, they depend, first it depends on the quality of the water because depending on the amount of silicate, dissolved silicate, dissolved phosphate, you, it works or doesn't work because, I mean, silica, all the oxyanines are competitors basically for the, this kind of small, uh, small uh, unit, what I showed you this. So basically, uh, if you have a lot of silicate or lot of phosphate, phosphate you, you are not going to absorb as well the arsenic there. So that's the first uh, problem. After you have all the problem of the free radicals which are generated. So again, there, there are lots of uh, studies on uh, this free radical chemistry in the, in the water. So uh, yeah, it changes a lot the, the water. But it's, uh, and again, uh, it can, uh, uh, <coughs> you have to, to control everything because you have to control also the manganese because if you end up by releasing the manganese, it's not good either. I mean, uh, so you have, it's not, uh, it's not a paradise system. I mean, it, it works, but it's, uh, I mean, it, it has to be uh, really studied in detail. And the problem is, as you saw, I mean, from one well to the other well, you have different chemistry. And that's really the problem to solve the problem. Right? Are there any efforts to uh, try to clean up? To not? To try and clean up now. Uh, I mean, the well water system. Well, so if you don't know the story, first there has been a big trial by uh, Bangladesh against the British Geological Survey because basically the World Bank and uh, UNICEF and all that, they asked the British Geological Survey to drill these wells and, to, and they were supposed to look for the quality. And uh, so what has to be said also is that at the time where they were starting this work, it was very hard uh, to analyze arsenic. It is still not easy. I mean, 10 ppb level is, uh, you have already a few labs which can do that correctly. I mean, it's, a, it's not a very easy task. Uh, so uh, the first thing is that, is that uh, the, the people who drill the wells, I mean, were basically accused to do this mass poison. So uh, in fact, BGS was about to be bankrupt just by the, this trial. I mean, it was very, it was a very complicated uh, uh, loss, loss. Anyway, so after the question is, do you try to, to, to clean, I mean, to treat the water? And the problem is, again, the, the number of, um, of um, the number of wells. If, I mean, there are techniques. I mean, I show you this kind of filter technique. You can adapt it to a well. There are people who have adapted that to a well. You can even use the, the rice husk you know, the, what is around the rice, it's a very good to make filter, it's pure silica. So you make very good filters. And, I mean, there are a lot of techniques which can be developed, but the question is the maintenance. You have one to 10 million wells, how in a very poor country you maintain them. So there are a group in um, Lausanne who is developing, for example, um, like, you know, the pH, uh, the, how do you call that? pH indicate strips, yeah. So they are developing that with bacteria, so, and which will lead to a change of color depending on the concentration. Because all the field uh, techniques to be used for arsenic are not very reliable, and that's also a big uh, discussion. Because one of the things before to treat, what they have been doing is just tagging the, the wells which were be, uh, above, I don't know, 50 or 100 the PPB, they just paint it in red, boom. <laughs> that's, uh, uh, so just to, to force the people to shift to better uh, wells. But after there have been lots of discussion because often these measurements were not very accurate. So there are also lots of work <coughs> to, to have accurate um, bioengineered way to measure the arsenic concentration. And, uh, and after, yeah, after it's, a, it's a problem of organization. I mean, uh, uh, UNICEF was reporting at this meeting that they have uh, set up, I don't know, 10,000 uh, of these uh, of these uh, filters, and already that for them. I mean, and UNICEF is not the local owner; it's much um, more resource. I mean, it was already hard, and in fact, after two or three years, you could see that I mean that uh, they started to have problems. So it's 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 not at all. I mean, scientifically, it's feasible although with all the care I said, all the difference of chemistry and so on. But uh, the problem is really how to set it up on a huge, huge scale. That's really, and so 
most of the people at this conference, I mean, the people who are really doing work, field work, policy, and so on, they say basically you have to adapt community wells, community treatment. You cannot, you cannot treat these millions of wells. You, uh, in fact, you, Calcutta is a very good water because they are just treating the water. I mean, and, and Hanau is the same thing. So you, you know, uh, the people know how to do that. Just you have to, uh, you have to have large enough quantities. That means tubing system. I mean, uh, to um, to to treat uh, to treat the water and control the treatment. So now it's what is going on. For example, in the Shagda where we were working, now they are setting up the tubing system. But again, you have fights. I mean, social class fights. Who get the water? Who don't get the water? And all that. But that's out of our. I mean, I'm a poor scientist. So I mean, yeah, it's not my field anymore. So, but it's important. Thank <laughs> you.